And thank you for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Ephraim Graham. The day brought a search and rescue mission for 10 U.S. sailors missing after a Navy guided missile destroyer collided with a merchant ship. Take a look and you can see a gaping hole was left on the rear side of the USS John S. McCain. The impact caused significant damage to the hull and caused flooding to nearby compartments. Malaysian maritime officials say the incident happened in Malaysian waters. At the moment, there are 10 sailors missing. Right? Five injured, but uh, they are in stable condition. They, four are being treated at the Singapore hospital. One uh, is re receiving uh, outpatient treatment. So basically they are stable. So whereas 10 sailors are missing. President Donald Trump and Senator John McCain tweeted asking for prayers for the sailors. It is the second collision involving a Navy ship in the Pacific in two months. Seven sailors died in June when the USS Fitzgerald and a container ship hit each other in the waters off Japan. The racial fallout continues over President Trump's response to the violence in Charlottesville. More lawmakers are now speaking out against him. As a new poll shows, his popularity going down in three states that helped to put him over the top. Can the White House turn things around? That's the question CBN's Jenna Browder is exploring. She's in Washington. President Trump is back in Washington, but after his response to the violence in Charlottesville, his support among lawmakers and the American people is taking a real hit. In Boston this weekend, thousands gathered to denounce racism and bigotry, something many feel Trump hasn't done forcefully enough. You look at both sides, I think there's blame on both sides. It's going to be very difficult for this president to lead if, in fact, that moral authority remains compromised. The only black Republican in the Senate called on Trump to sit down with people who have suffered from racism. Without that personal connection to the painful past, it will be hard for him to regain that moral authority from my perspective. We all have obligations as leaders to not put salt in the wound to bring a decency and a respect to the table to say, look, we're going to call evil what it is. House Democrats are calling for Trump to be censored or formally reprimanded. And Democratic Senator Cory Booker is taking another step, tweeting, I will be introducing a bill to remove Confederate statues from the U.S. Capitol building. Trump is getting conflicting advice from his team, this according to his former chief strategist who was ousted on Friday. Steve Bannon told the Washington Post, quote, no administration in history has been so divided among itself about the direction about where it should go. This comes as a new poll shows Trump's popularity going down in three states that helped propel him to victory. In Michigan, only 36 percent of registered voters say they approve of his performance. In Pennsylvania, just 35 percent approve. And in Wisconsin, that number has fallen to 34 percent. It all happens right here. Those close to Trump are coming to his defense and vouching for his character. On Friday, we sat down with Laura Trump, his daughter-in-law, for CBN's Faith Nation. My father-in-law has been very clear that there is no room in this country for racism, for bigotry, for hatred like we saw in Charlottesville. If you talk to anyone who's known Donald Trump for a long time, they will tell you he doesn't have a racist bone in his body. So what can Trump do to bring healing to this racial division? Will the firing of Bannon help? And what does it mean for getting anything done? Lawmakers and the American people are waiting to see. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. The president is back at the White House today following a 17-day working vacation. His first order of business, a televised address to the nation this evening on the strategy going forward in Afghanistan. The president spent a full day last week discussing strategy with his national security team. No word on the details of his announcement, but indications are that he will continue to fulfill the U.S. commitment in Afghanistan. In France, one person is dead and another injured after a van rammed into two different bus stops. The attacks happened in different areas of the port city of Marseille. Police arrested the driver but say it is too early to call it terrorism. Meanwhile, authorities have confirmed the identity of the driver of the deadly van attack that killed 15 people in Barcelona. 22-year-old Yunus Abi Yukubi is still on the run. The native Moroccan is believed to have worked alone in that attack. 
Well, it is eclipse day. Millions of Americans are gathering at points across the country to see the first total eclipse to sweep from coast to coast in nearly 100 years. In Oregon, long lines of cars as people try to get the first glimpse of the eclipse. The celestial shadow will begin its journey across the U.S. at 1.16 p.m. Eastern Time and exit in South Carolina 191 minutes later in Charleston. Crowds are gathering and shops are doing some big business. It's a once in a lifetime thing. Uh, they say that almost every person that sees it, it's the biggest event of their life. The shadow will cut a 60 to 70 mile wide swath through 14 states. The longest stretch of darkness will be two minutes and 44 seconds in southern Illinois. All of North America will get at least a partial eclipse as the moon passes between the sun and the earth. Scientists warn people not to watch the eclipse without special glasses. You can do some lasting damage to your eyes if you do. A NASA webcast will, will follow the eclipse as it crosses America, and you can learn more about eclipses and how to see this one at our website. And of course, that is CBNnews.com. On the Appalachian Trail, we follow this hiker's more than 2,000 mile journey to healing and wholeness. We've got the story coming up after this. Every year, thousands attempt to hike the entire Appalachian Trail from start to finish, only one in four completed. When Paul Stutzman took his first steps on the more than 2,000 mile trek, he wanted more than just a great adventure. He was looking for an encounter with God. Wendy Griffith brings us this story. Paul Stutzman lived a great life, happily married, three children, and a great job managing a large restaurant in Ohio's Amish country. Then in 2002, doctors diagnosed his beloved wife, Mary, with breast cancer. Although they did everything they could and believed God would heal her, Mary passed away four years later. This devastated Paul leaving him consumed with a burning question for God. Where were you when my wife died? A year after Mary's death, and still with no answer, Paul knew he had to do something different. And I just felt God saying, it's time, give it up, go on the trail, and I'm gonna meet you there. So Paul quit his job and started his journey on the famous Appalachian Trail. Nearly 2,200 miles of rugged wilderness that begins in Springer Mountain, Georgia, and passes through 14 states, ending in Mount Katahdin, Maine. What was going through your mind those nights in the shelter? The first night on the Appalachian Trail, I'm in my tent, and I'm laying there, I can't sleep, because it's raining, and I just gave up a good job to get out here in the woods getting rained on, and so I just sort of reflected back on my life and, and how I'd grown up, and I just told God that night, you're going to be my hiking partner, and I want to know some, I want answers, and I want to know more about grace. How long did the journey take you? I had planned on six months, but uh, growing up the way I did Amish and then Mennonite, we have a strong work ethic. And so I'd get up early in the morning and I'd just hike all day, and I ended up doing it in four and a half months, which is pretty fast. What did you average every day on the trail? My average on the whole uh, hike was 17 and a half miles a day, but that includes eight days where I took a zero day, which means a day off. Everybody on the trail has a trail name. What was your trail name? I picked the trail name Apostle, and I took that name. Obviously, my name is Paul, so I was the Apostle Paul, and 500 miles up the trail is Damascus, Virginia. So I was the Apostle Paul heading to Damascus. <laughs> <laughs> what was your favorite state? Uh, I enjoyed Virginia, especially. Virginia is the longest state of, of, of the states, probably about 600 miles, uh, but it's not quite as difficult as perhaps like uh, Georgia or New Hampshire and Maine. But the scenery coming over the Shenandoah National Park, the scenery is just gorgeous in Virginia. During his first month on the trail, Paul lost 30 pounds and got in the best shape of his life. But the average person burns 2,000 calories a day. A hiker on the Appalachian Trail would burn 6,000, so you can't eat enough. And so about once a week, I'd hitchhike into town because I had food boxes sent to me about every 100 miles. So I'd go to a post office and get my food box. And then since I'm in town, I go to a restaurant and hopefully they have a buffet because, oh, you can just eat and eat and eat and eat and then get a motel room and get a shower. And a shower and a warm bed is such a luxury after you've been out in the woods for 10 nights sleeping in a tent and in a sleeping bag. 
Paul had it walking in the woods, day after day, sleeping in shelters, getting rained on, going hungry sometimes. How did all that help you heal after your wife died? I was exhausted. My body was exhausted, but my mind was becoming very sharp and in focus. And as the farther I would hike and the, the, and the more tired I got, the more clear my mind became. And I started seeing a purpose in what God was doing as I'm meeting people. Day after day, Paul cried out to God. Then, on a Sunday morning, somewhere in New Hampshire, he finally got his answer. He took me on my face in tears when he revealed to me why I was on this trail. And God said, you're writing a book, put this message in the book. While it wasn't the personal message he was hoping and expecting, Paul saw it as a word for everyone. Jesus is coming back. What I heard was that I had to take your wife to get you out here in this mountainside to hear that message. And tell people that I, I am coming back. I am control. I know what's going on. And what would you tell to people that are maybe even now going through the loss of a spouse? It does get better. It takes time. And time it, with time, the healing comes. And I think it's, it's good to know, though, grieving means we love somebody. The only way not to grieve is not to love. Our loved ones want us to go on with life. You know, they, they've got it made. They're in heaven, they're just having a ball. But they want us to enjoy life. And there's a lot to, there's a lot to enjoy. And you actually thought about what would be on your tombstone at the end of your life. Would I just want it to say, I worked all of my life at a restaurant and passed away? Or would I want it to say, he took a chance, he took a risk, and he quit his job, and he hiked the Appalachian Trail. And it, I decided I wanted to read that way. Wendy Griffith, CBN News. He took on the NFL to expose the danger to the very brains of its players. And he tells us how he was prepared for the fight of his life. Next. Benito Malo is a forensic pathologist who took on the NFL with an explosive discovery to the game's danger to the very brains of its players. Omalo is sharing that journey in his life in his new book, Truth Doesn't Have a Side. He sat down with us for this week's Studio 5 interview. But first, his look at the scene from the film Concussion. And you'll hear from the what actor, Will Smith. The NFL wants you to say you made it all up. I made it up. They're terrified of you. If you could briefly say, who is Dr. Omalu? Oh, doc, Dr. Omalu is a um, really interesting, uh, paradoxical creature, you know. Bennett Omalu was born into a poor family in the jungles of Nigeria. He immigrated to America earned eight degrees and became a forensic pathologist in Pittsburgh. He's a man of science uh, uh, firmly, but he is also one of the most spiritually, uh, uh, religiously based people I've ever met in my life. Everything in his life is about God. Many of us meet you first in the film Concussion as Will Smith portrays your character. Uh, and we see some pretty tough fights for you there. What's your relationship with football today? My relationship with football is good, I should believe so, because whatever I've done about football has been in that spirit of us all being members of one another, one body, one spirit, one hope, bound together by the bond of peace of Christ. I don't hate football. I actually love football. I love the NFL, but Knowing what we know today, in the 21st century, there is no justifiable reason whatsoever, especially as a Christian and as a physician, that any child younger than the age of 18 should continue to play the high impact, high contact collision sports. You're right, I'm in speaking of the football player that you meet on the autopsy table. I met Mike Webster on the autopsy table. When I met him, I knew I had to find the answers for the problems that plagued him. This was my calling, my duty as a fellow human being made in the image of God. In that moment, you knew that was your duty? I did not know what was to come, but I was embedded in my faith that if I walk in the way of God, that I wouldn't get lost. And when I saw Mike Webster, I may get emotional. This was a man that morning, I, I heard about people talk about him. 
in the most derogatory ways. And as a forensic pathologist, I was offended. But I asked myself, if this man had to play this game wearing a helmet, there was a risk of traumatic brain injury. Mike Webster suffered depression. All my life, I struggled with depression and very low self-esteem because I was born as a refugee. First four years of my life, I, I suffered malnutrition and the psychological trauma of war. So it affected me. I'm permanently mine, if you could say that. So when I walked up to him on the autopsy table, I saw myself in him. And as a Christian, we know he, the God we worship is the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. He's not God of the dead. When the physical body dies, it's a, a, a transhumation. The spirit lives to the glory of God. So I was talking to his spirit. Because uh, the same spirit that lives in me is the same spirit that lives in Mike Webster and the same spirit that lives in you. And I said to him, Mike Webster, let's get to the bottom of this. Let's get to the truth. That is why my book is Truth Doesn't Have a Side. Your life really prepared you for this fight from the very beginning. You talk about the fact that you were born a refugee. You, your mom, and your dad are all essentially in a refugee hospital at the very same time. Your mother being treated for being delivered, your dad being treated for he being was, a victim of war. Yeah, he was hit by one of the bombs. In fact, they believed he was dead. So the Catholic charities picked up his body to place it in the truck for the mass grave and he groaned. So they said, oh, he's alive. So they moved him to the local dilapidated refugee hospital. You know what a refugee hospital will be. And my father, really. Because what happens when you are in some type of difficulty in life? We many times are short-sighted, okay? And my advice is just be at peace. Embrace the love of God. Because you do not know what lies ahead. My father, when about two weeks after I was born, when he could hold me, he was handed, I was handed to him. And he held me in his bosom and said, his name would be Bennett from Benoit, blessed. For he is a blessing unto my life. And he gave me the middle name, Ifa Kando. Life is the greatest gift of all. And guess what? My name, Onyamalukube, my last name, means he who knows must come forth and speak. Little did I know, even when I was struggling with depression. And Dr. Romalo's book is available wherever books are sold. We'll be right back. Big cities often have a big problem, homelessness. D.C. is tackling that in a unique way with one special ministry. Amber Strong has the story. In the heart of Washington, D.C., one of the nation's most prosperous cities, lies a deep secret. While tourists see the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial, what they may not see are the nearly 8,000 homeless men and women sleeping on the streets and in shelters. The good news? Dozens of churches and social programs are working to change that statistic. And while some of the problems with chronic homelessness are obvious, a unique ministry in the heart of the district is tackling an issue most wouldn't think twice about. A driver's license or a state ID can open up the door to possibility. But try losing one of these, and you'll watch those same doors slam close. So our whole system uh, in this country is based on being able to be tracked and prove who you are, uh, even more so since 2001 um, with the 9-11 attacks. And so at this point, you can't really do anything if you don't have an ID. That's where Foundry United Methodist steps in. A team of volunteers led by Pastor Ben Roberts are working to give the city's homeless a new ID and a fresh start. And the main things that we see is that, um, that people are prevented from uh, obtaining are employment, employment um, jobs, and education, and then housing as well. Uh, and with you, when you have a ministry focused on unhoused uh, individuals, you want to get them into stable housing, you want to get them into affordable housing, but they can't do that unless they have uh, ID that they can produce. Robert says there are a variety of reasons people end up without an ID. Uh, and they probably got there either because um, they were robbed, 
Um, they were living on the street and somebody came and attacked them, took their belongings. Uh, it could be that they lost their items uh, or their items got soaking wet when they're out sleeping in the rain. But obtaining new identification isn't as easy as you think. So you come in, you have nothing, no birth certificate, no social security card, uh, and no ID. We kind of call it the trinity is what we're getting at. Um, and when somebody comes with nothing, we have to start with a medical record. And we start there uh, because it's the only thing that we've seen that works in terms of helping somebody get their social security card. From there, like a network of detectives, the team at Foundry tracked down the necessary info make the phone calls, file the paperwork, even foot the bill that comes along with helping the clients prove their identity. The process can take anywhere from three weeks to more than a year. According to Roberts, besides a few grants, the ministry has been completely funded by members of the church. Cleveland Thompson is proof the mission works. He says Foundry helped him get his ID, provided him with clothing, and even gave him counseling for spiritual needs along the way. You know, so they told me, you know, I asked they was helping me, say, you need anything, stuff like that, here's my car, give me a call, and stuff like that, I'll come by or any time, come to our church service, which that helped out too, because I was at that, at that time, uh, my frame of mind was like, you know, a little lonely. He says now he has a new car, an apartment, and a job working for the government. And he's spreading the message about the program too. Uh, just brought my cousin down. I didn't need anything today, so I was telling him about it. So this is his first time going through this. So I told him, I said, you know, this is the place to go, and just go whatever you need, some stuff like that. So now you're helping other people. Helping other people, supposed to. Robert says that's exactly the point of the ministry, to spread love to their neighbors, both seen and unseen. Amber C. Strong, CBN News, in our nation's capital. It's time now for your Monday motivation, and I hope this message will jumpstart your week. Consider this, God's call on your life is like a magnet, and it is pulling you through every obstacle that would block you from fulfilling that purpose. The call can't be stopped. It just needs you to answer. With that word, make this a marvelous Monday. That is going to do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. Thank you so much for watching. Make this a marvelous Monday. We'll see you right back here come tomorrow.